Jesus' name. Father, today we have met again, as we normally do every week when we celebrate the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. And this minute, we have another interesting topic. Lord, before we go into our topic, we just want to ask your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. I want God to be our guide, to instruct us in every instruction, in every guidance, in every steps of our way, that God be the head to lead us through, even as we enter this new year. May the Lord, who is the guardian of our hearts, be the leaders of our way. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy Spirit, open our eyes to understand. For when we know not what to say as we ought, the Spirit of God helpeth our infirmity. We go on it that cannot be uttered. When we go on, the Spirit is said to testify that we are the sons of God. Holy Spirit, manifest your power in us. Prove yourself once again by teaching us exactly how to go about this message. That in everything, your name alone will be glorified. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Brethren, Tonight, we have another important topic. And before we go ahead, I just want to use this opportunity to introduce ourselves. My name is Missionary Collins. I'm a member of Christian Grove Foundation and the head of Open Heart Fellowship. Our service is every Tuesday by 7 p.m. But today, on Sunday, 5 p.m., we use the opportunity to celebrate with the Lord as we go understanding the understanding prophecy. Understanding prophecy is a message that comes every Sunday by 5 p.m. And this understanding prophecy gives you a hint to understand the background of biblical prophecy. We take it step by step, verse by verse, until the whole prophecy of the Bible are well explained. We do not compound the entire prophecy in one teaching, but we use opportunity to expand it little by little until you understand it. In just one hour, we invite you to join us every week. God bless you as you participate. Brethren, now as we are about to start, today we are looking at a very important topic. Letter to the church in Sardis. The church in Sardis is an important part of the book of Revelation. Our text today is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, chapter 3 from verse 1. But before we go ahead to our test, I just want to explain something about why Christ picked the church of Sardis. Sardis is a place where you normally find the sardine stone. The sardine stone was known for its abundance. It's supposed to be a precious stone, but because it's too abundant, it becomes useless because abundance reduces the value of an object so the same thing happened in our christian faith when things that are supposed to be rare in your christian life become so abundant it, it loses its value so sardine christ addressed a church that was once vibrant thriving that means it was once a precious stone to god very vibrant and rare. Traveling, but it's now merely going through the motion because it has lost its value, just like the certain stone. Living off the reputation of the founder, tradition, history, they claim to be alive. But Jesus revealed the sober truth in no uncertain terms. Letting them know they are actually dead. So today we also have churches who are living off the founder. Because the founders were strong men of God. Who were rare men of God. Men who can be reckoned with power, wisdom, knowledge and understanding. But today, the people who took over from them are actually dead. Even though the founder was once alive. They did not follow the instruction of the founder. Neither did they continue in his way. So as a result, 
they were not alive but dead. You know, rumors are so ugly because they generally are untrue. For example, have you heard this rumor? There are those who are saying that the book of Revelation is hard to understand. <laughs> but Bandash says, we, for you see, the word of Revelation means something has been revealed. That means it was formerly a mystery. But this mystery is not revealed. How can something that has been revealed be difficult to understand? Revelation is no longer a mystery because the mystery has been made known to us. That's why it's called revelation, not prophecy. It's a revelation because we it was once a mystery to us when it was still hidden. When we do not know what it means. But Christ came and opened the seal. And make it known to us. And the scroll is available. He explained the trumpet. He explained the bow. And explained the seal. And the intervals. Between the seal. Between the bow. And the millennium. The battle of Megiddo. He explained all to us. There is no more secret in Revelation. Because it's not a mystery that is revealed. And sets the place where God told John specifically, though it was revealed, to keep on that wrap until the end. So there is a reason for why that place was seal up. And until God decides to show us what was hidden, we cannot know. So that is still the only mystery that you and I cannot solve because we don't know what he said. So when the mystery is revealed, it's not a mystery. So the book of Revelation is just like every other book of prophecy. And can be used on your Sunday sermon. And can be taught in your churches. But it's not, I repeat, it's not allegorical interpretation. The book of Revelation are true. It is an overview of the planet. God's explanation of his heart to man. So, it's a barrier of those who think they can read Indian into the scriptures and misinterpret it. Because anyone that adds to it, we add to his prayer in the land. And anyone that removes from it, God will remove his name from the book of life. And that's not only for revelation. In fact, that is the entire Bible, by the way. If you remove from it, God will remove your name from the book of life. If you add to it, God will add to your prayer in the land. And all the things that are written in this book. And that's why many Christians try to just stay away from it. Because they don't want to add or remove so that God will not add to their prayer. Or remove their name from the book of life. So... It's good when you are explaining it to stay concise. If you don't understand it, do some research. I believe every interpretation of it is already in the scripture. So you can read and understand exactly what Christ is saying. This book begins with the word of revelation of Christ. And God wanted us to read the book. And this book of prophecy was not given to angels. It was not given to some college of theology. It was not given to some pastors in our church. This book was given to the church to save life now. It is meant for both new converts and those who are mature Christian. This book of Revelation was actually the gospel to the believers. It was not the gospel to unbelievers. It was the gospel for the believers in Christ. Those who have come to God, who understand who God is, and have learned from Him, understand His message. Those are whom this word are for. This word is going to be very technical, but it's not intended for pastors, but it's intended for believers. 
to understand the truth so that they can save life now. Because the Bible says if you know the wrath of God that will come upon the ungodly, you will persuade men. So this word was given to you so that you can use it to persuade people not to go to hell. To persuade people about the dangers of the second coming of Christ. To persuade people about the things to come at the very end of the world. And this is the reason why this word was given to you. And that's why we will do our best to one step at a time explain the meaning in detail and the logic behind each verse. Having said the book of Revelation is plain, I also believe there are figures of speech in the scriptures. The Bible contains more than 100 figures of speech. And those figures of speech are used like simile, metaphor, or zimoron, and so on in the scripture, just like your basic English book. And so, having understand those figures of speech, we will know when to switch the tenses and when not to switch the tenses. When to explain in detail and when to go ahead. And so therefore, in chapter 1 of this book of Revelation, the blessing was abound. Blessing is found in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, saying, Blessed is he who read those who heard the word of this prophecy. That means Christ tells you that the book of Revelation was called Revelation because it's a mystery that is now revealed, but it's actually a book of prophecy. Just like prophecies according to Jeremiah, prophecy according to Isaiah, this prophecy is of Christ. That if you understand the book of the word of this prophecy and keep those things which are written for it, for the time that is now. The time of the end is near. And that's why this prophecy was written for the near time. But God knew that this would still be those who, that there would still be those who claim revelations is hard to understand. So to make this book easy to understand, he also included an easy follow outline that is found in Revelation chapter 1 verse 19, where Jesus gave John this instruction. Let's go to Revelation 1 verse 19. Let's see the instruction that Jesus gave to John on how to interpret this book of Revelation. Written therefore, write therefore the things you see. That means the thing John has already seen. What have John said? Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. It's no longer the same Jesus Christ, the Lamb that was taken to the cross in Calvary and slaughtered. No, this is a glorious Messiah. The Lion is no longer the Lamb that was sacrificed. But it's now the lion of the tribe of Judah who has conquered death and has risen from the dead. And therefore the glory of God is at work in his life. And the second thing is that the things which are signifies what is today in the churches. What are the presence, what are the character available in the church of God today? And that was what John was writing about. There was character that was predominantly in the church in those days. That was what John was writing about. And the next thing he was writing about is things that happen after the church ends. The church is not a eternal instrument. The church has a beginning and it has an end. So grace might be abundance. It might be called extravagant, but it has an end. So there is nothing in this world that is created that has no beginning and ending. 
So, how to understand the topics on which Revelation was written? We are in the second topic, which is the things that are today, the churches. And one of those churches was service, the service church. The church that has a name that they are alive, but they are actually dead. So we have many of such churches on earth today. Oh, they have a wonderful name that is a living church. But in actual sense, the church has lost its glory. It has died off. The presence of the Holy Spirit has left the church. The leader has grown from good to worst. And that's what we are going to be studying today. And it suddenly become an object of study because there was once a vibrant church. A church where God was proud of. But those they see cover themselves with such a name, cover themselves with religion like April. But the name is dead. They no longer have life in them. It's just an empty name. Just like when the ark of the children of Israel entered the camps of the Philistines, when the children of Israel shouted that the earth rang and rang again. And the Philistines said, within their heart, we are finished. Who, who can save us from such a mighty God? But the Bible said it was an empty shout. Why? Because God was not with them. If God comes into the camp, you don't need to shout. The power of God will be present. But when the church shouts with such a high voice, it might run the heaven. And rang it again. People, even the enemy might be thrown into confusion. But if God is not in the shout, it's an empty shout. Today, there are many churches that have such praises. But behold, it's an empty shout. Because God is not available in the church in his power. They have good messages. But they lack the power thereof. They hold a form of godliness. But they deny the power that comes with godliness. Write the things which you have seen. Up to the point John see the resurrected and glorify Christ. In chapter 1. Jesus tell John to write the things which are referred to the churches age ago. Which is now today. The church of this age. Which began in 32 AD. And continue up to the present day. And it's prophesied in chapter 2 and 3. Which are study, which we are studying today. But finally, Jesus tells John to write the things which shall take place after the churches. That is from verse chapter 4 of Revelation up to chapter 21. And after this, John is told to write about the future events. That will take place after the church age ends. So the church age began. When it did begin, the church age began in 32 AD. And how does it start? By the coming of the Holy Spirit. In a mystery, born out of mystery, Christian speaks in unexplainable tongues. That the people heard it in their various tongues and languages. That was how the church was born. And how is the church going to end? In a mystery. Being caught up in the rapture of the saints. Snatched away from the earth. That is how the church age will, be, will come to an end. Mystery. So the church was born in a mystery and end in a mystery. And after the church age... We will revert back to the age which is known as the post-church age, the period of tribulation. And that is exactly what we'll be explaining later on, not today, but in subsequent dates of this teaching. Now, the word used for this are the word called Meza Tarota. 
Meza Tarota in Greek. That's significant because in order to help us find the place in Revelation, here are the third acts that begin after the church age end. God marked the spots with the exact same phrase, Meta Tau. Talita. So all you have to do is to look for the next place in the book where the face show up and you will find the beginning of the third of act of revelation which is things that happen after the church. In that place in revelation is chapter 4 from verse 1. Let me read it to you after this thing. Here is it, the mediator after the church is over. John writes, I look, behold, a door was open in heaven. What happened? A door is open for the sights to come up. That is what happened after the event of the church is ended. The door is open for the saints in heaven. And I heard it, the first voice. I heard was that the voice in chapter 1 was like what? A trumpet. The trumpet of God sounded. And what happened when the trumpet sounded, speaking with me, the trumpet was sounding in the ears of the unbeliever, but in the ears of the Christian was actually calling us, saying to us, come up here. God is opening door in heaven with the voice of a trumpet calling the saints to come up here and I will show you things that will happen after the church I will show you things that will happen after the church and this is the message that God has sent to us after the church is over and that's what appearing over 20 times in the first chapter of Revelation, what word will never again appear in the narrative? For one, the word church. That's right. We are going to learn because the church will no longer be on earth after Revelation. And after, for one, the church like John is going to go up. When the church goes up, what comes down? The wrath of God. Because God promised that we will not see his wrath. And this is not isolated incident in the scripture. It happened throughout the Bible ages. When God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he said to Lot, he should flee to the mountain, for he cannot do anything until they have come tied up. That he cannot touch Sodom until they are out of Sodom. And the angel said to Abraham that God forbid that God will destroy the wicked and the righteous. That means God also sworn in many places in the scripture that we will not see his wrath. So, it is not possible for the Christian to be on earth when God pour out his wrath on the earth. Because when we talk about the revelation and the tribulation, we are not talking about Satan's Antichrist mark alone. We are talking about the wrath of God. And God cannot punish us who are his children with the world together. He will not. Because he promised the saints that they will not endure his wrath. So let's go forward to our study of today. Unto the angels, Revelation 3 from verse 1, to the angel or the messenger of the church in service, write, These are the word of him who has the seven spirit of God, the sevenfold Holy Spirit ministry, and the seven stars. I know your record. And what you are doing right now, you're supposed to be alive, but in reality, you are dead. It takes only a man with spiritual eyes to see these things. Because people can...
can easily be deceived by acting alive, behaving alive, looking alive while you are actually dead. But you can deceive man, but certainly not God. God sees your works. He sees your Christian record. He saw your service yesterday. He saw how many, how amazing your sermon was. He knows how many people are actually in your church that are Christians. He knows all those things. So you have a name that you live, but actually you are dead. And he saw it. And he knows it. And he said in verse 3, in verse 2, Rose yourself and keep awake. Strengthen and invigorate what remain and is on the point of dying. For I have not found a thing that you have done or your works that is remaining. I have not found it meeting the requirement of God or perfect in his sight. Today, ask yourself a question. If Christ, the Messiah, shall show up today, now that you don't expect him, will you find your work perfect before him? Will you find your work meeting the expectation of the goal he set for us in the book of Matthew chapter 5? Will Christ find your work favorable in his sight? Or will he come into your congregation today? Will the church be happy to receive their Lord? Or have their garment be spotted with the word? Or have their garment of righteousness be stained with the sins of nature? Or by the science and the God of this world? God is coming very soon, but he's asking you, if he come, will he find faith in the earth? Will the world be happy to receive his Lord? Will the earth rejoice to receive her king? That is the question. You are to answer. And he is asking you, if you know your work is not perfect, you are still in the period of grace. Time is now. Strengthen those things that remain. The things that are still in your church. The things that are still in the congregation. When we talk about church, we are not talking about the building. We are talking about the mystery church. The Holy Spirit given give them body in the believers. It's known as the mystery church. Your building is not important to God. It's the people. The people is what made the church. It's not the building. It doesn't matter how beautiful your building is, but your people must be holy. And God is asking, if He come today, those th things that remain in your church, have you strengthened them? Those people that still remain faithful, that are hanging on by a thread, that are almost at the point of death in your church, have you strengthened them? Have you kept them alive so that they will not die before Christ return? Have you encouraged them? Have you put their faith on motion to preserve them to the very end? In verse 3 he said, So I call to, to mind the lessons you received and heard. He is not telling you to do a new thing. He is not telling you to teach a new doctrine. You've already heard the doctrine from the apostles, from the disciple of Christ, and he's asking you to teach the same lesson. You should hold on to it and continue laying them to the heart and obey them and repent in case you will not rose yourself and keep awake and watch. I will come to you like a thief. I will come like a thief in the night. And you will not know or suspect at what hour I will come. And this is the Lord telling you. He is not going to come like many people tell you. Every eyes will see him. No, he will come like a thief in the night. And he will come like a thief in the night. And you will not know the time he will come. And you will not see him when he comes. And you will still have a few persons evil names in sadis who have not soiled their clothes. You still have few people in sadis who have not stained their garments with the world, who have not lost after the war because of the abundance of precious stone, who have not gone from good to worse 
because of how abundant they think their blessing was. But I say to you, <laughs> those people that have not stained their garments, they will walk with me in white. Because why? They are worthy and deserving. So if you are worthy and deserving, you will walk with Christ in white. Christ is not selecting people to be saved. It's those who qualify that will be saved. He's not going to choose based on race or tribe or based on height or based on growth. He's going to choose based on quality. If you meet his standard, you will be saved. Today, be ready to meet the standard of Christ so that your life can be spared. And he said in verse 5 that thus he who con conquer is victorious and be clothed in white garment. And I will not erase or blot his name from the book of life. So God has a warning for the saints. If you conquer, your name will not be taken away from the book of life. But what happens if you refuse to conquer? If you remove, remain your sin, your name will be taken. Though the saints, the day you accepted Christ, your name was written in the book of life. There is no one saved, forever saved. There is nothing like that exists. You are saved once. The day you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and believe Him from the heart and confess Him with your mind, you are saved. Your name is written in the book of life. But if you refuse to continue, let me tell you what will happen. There will be a big eraser who will wipe your name away from the book of life. But now God is telling you, if you hold on to the doctrine you will receive from the beginning, from the same salvation, the same love of God that leads you to repentance, and you hold on to it to the end, your name will not be erased. Your name will be on the book of life. But if you refuse to hold on and you go after the world, God will erase your name away from the book of life. Your name can be erased. It can be cleaned away. So there is nobody that has total immunity. Immunity does not exist in salvation. Remember for the term for soldiers. When is the battle secure? When you drive home. Until you are in the sky going up to heaven. You have not finished your battle in the world. So your salvation should be guided until you are in the air traveling to heaven. But while you are still on earth, hold on to the things you have to the end so that no man steal your garment. And the Lord is saying to you that I know your name. I will acknowledge him that as mine. And I will confess his name. If you confess God before the world, he will also confess your name openly before his father and his angels. But if you refuse to confess him before men, he will also be ashamed to confess you before his father and the angel in heaven. So the choice is yours. Are you ready for God to confess you? Or do you want God to confess you? You must first of all confess God for God to be bold enough to confess you. Now, in verse 6, he who is able to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Do you have ear? That is the question. If you know you don't have ear, this message is not for you. But if you know you have ear to hear, this message is for you. Hear what God is saying to the churches. <laughs> in verse 7, in verse 6, he make it clear to you, if you have ear, you should hear what he's saying to the churches. Now, let's go back. God make it clear to us, for one, it is the word, the church, the rights. We are going to learn but that because the church will no longer be on earth after revelation. For one, the church is like John, is going to go up. And when the church goes up, what comes down? The wrath of God. And that is when this judgment will happen. In the case of Sodom, 
for most of us who have forgotten. So don't continue in their sin to the extent they were ready to sexually assault the angels. And that did not go unpunished. Do not think the evil and the wickedness, the lie, the deception, and all the inhuman behavior out today will go unpunished. No wickedness will ever go unpunished. Remember what God says, though hand passes hand, the wicked will never go unpunished. So do not think that the power is in your hands. Though we the saints do not avenge ourselves upon the earth, there is one that executes vengeance on our behalf. That is God himself. And he is telling you that he knows the work and every activity and event that is going on upon the earth. The fact that he is not on the street killing all the wicked does not mean he doesn't know what is happening on the earth. The reason is because he has said, like Christ wrote in the book of Matthew, let both the wheat and the tithes grow to harvest. There is a harvest for the earth. There are two forms of harvest. There is harvest for wheat, where the scent will be taken. There is also harvest for grape, where men will feed the wrath of God, as written in Isaiah chapter 63. The grape harvest is not the harvest you will want to be. It's a terrible harvest, because your blood will be sprinkled upon his garment. And God will stain all his ramets. And the one traveling in the greatness of his strength, the one that is mighty to save, he will stain his garment with your blood. And that is not the judgment I want you to be on earth. And that's why this gospel is given to you to escape such a terrible judgment. To escape such a terrible judgment that is coming upon all human race. And that's why this word was given. To you to save life today. It's not to threaten you. No, it's not to make you afraid. This word was given to save life, to transform you so that you would not have to see the wrath of God. Because God said He created us in His image after His likeness. He does not want us to endure His wrath. That's why when we sin in the garden, He killed an innocent lamb who have not sinned after the similitude of man. And use it to clot us from our nakedness. Making it known to us that no act of religion or no act of obligation, no group we belong to on earth can clot us. No self-righteousness or self-denying can clot us. But it's by slaughtering an innocent lamb who has not committed sin after man. That is how man will be clotted. And that is what God is telling you today. That lamb has been slain from the foundation of the world to cover man from sin. But if you neglect such great a salvation, how can you escape? How can you escape the terrible judgment that is coming upon the earth? Not because God sent his son to condemn the world, but because if you refuse the son, you are condemned already. Because you refuse to believe in the name of the only begotten son of God, full of grace and truth. And they said to the mountain, and the rock fall on us. Hide us from the face of him that sat upon the throne. Do you want to be on earth when these things happen? When the power of the universe shall be shaken, and the stars will fall from the, from the sky, and the power of heaven will be shaken, and the universe will not give her light? Is that what you want to endure? If that is what you want to endure, you can continue. In your sin, remain unabated. The Lord is coming very soon. And what that God, the Father, from the rocks of the Lamb, who is the Lamb in the scripture? It's always Jesus. He goes in verse 17 of chapter 6 and says that the people will cry out, The great days of his world has come. Who shall be able to stand? That is the day of judgment. Who will be able to stand? There is going to be progression. And we travel through 2,000 years of the church history, chapter 2 and 3. And this church goes up to chapter 4, verse 1, with rocks coming down. And chapter 6 and verse 16. There will be seven years of tribulation that will take up chapter 
19 and at which time Jesus will return to the earth with the church in the event known as the second coming. And there will be even more revealed in our study through the incredible book. But there is what we know. If you love Jesus, your story will end with the word that lives happily ever after. But if you refuse Jesus, Revelation chapter 3, today, if you haven't turned, there's yet a time for you. You haven't turned, there is yet your Bible. Do that today. Because the church is not going to be here forever. There is not going to be evangelism pamphlet forever. There is not going to be missionary from door to door forever. There is not going to be evangelist in your street forever. There is not going to be pastors on your pulpit forever. We are going to the second act of the book, which Jesus described to John as the things which are today. We will be studying the fifth of the seven letters written by Jesus to the seven churches of the province of Asia and which we are studying now. And we know that each of these letters speaks four different levels. Each speaks of the local church in Asia in, 60, in 96 AD. Each letter speaks to all churches at all times, including yours and my church. And each letter speaks to all believers at all times, including you and me. And this is where we end our teaching for today. We will see you again next Sunday on Understanding Prophecy. And on Tuesday on our mission training, which is known as Open House Fellowship, where we use opportunity to explain to you the living word of God. God bless you. Brethren, let us pray. Before we pray, are you still limping between two opinions? Are you still among those who have taken to the popular science that has no proof? If I deny God exists, that will save me. That means I will no longer have opportunity to be saved. Oh, I will not see hell fire. I will not go to heaven. God is saying to you today, how can you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? which was first preached by angels, and it was followed up by those who heard him. Today is the acceptable day. Today is the day of salvation. You have opportunity to save your life now. Please use it. Let us pray. Father, as many that would receive you, to them you gave power to become sons of God, even to as many that believe in your name, who were born not of the flesh, not of the will of the flesh, but of the Spirit of God. Lord, today, as many that will hear this word of mine and return to you, you will give them power to become your children. Lord, as many that will believe from their heart and confess you from their mouth, today, give them the grace to be saved. Draw them to your name, that they will not experience your wrath, that in everything your name alone will be glorified. As many that are sick, let instant healing be their portion. As many that sit in darkness, light, light shine. As many that are in bondage, set them free so that they can be free from the God of this world and give their life to you. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you, brethren, and we hope to see you again by Sunday next week. Amen.